treat people how you want to be treated, right? I think that's the difference is there's no room in our there's no room in our world anymore for the vision of the, you know, tyrannical chef. Yeah. Like that I, <laughs> I wish that person good luck, but that just doesn't it doesn't exist. I, I I'm sure it exists. There's no place for it in our industry yeah. any longer. You're listening to season two of the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, we're going to talk to high performers in the food business, everything from chefs to CEOs, technologists, writers, investors, and more about how they innovate and operate and how they consistently execute at a high level day after day. And I would really love it if you could drop us a five-star review anywhere that you listen to your podcast. That could be Apple, that could be Spotify, it could be Google. I'm not picky. Anywhere works, but I really appreciate the support. And as always, I hope you enjoy the show. Anyways, I don't think we've met before. By the way. I don't think so, no. Now, we probably crossed paths a, a number of times. I'm super excited. I will tell you that there's some questions that some chefs asked me to ask. So you're going to get some today that didn't directly come from me. Okay. That I don't have as much context about, but I'm going to ask anyways, because right. I think people will, will enjoy it. And I think selfishly, to be honest, I will mostly be just getting some advice for everybody from you okay. and um, insights. I'll do my best. You have told your backstory enough times on enough shows and podcasts. I don't think we need to go into all of it. Although I'd love to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the restaurants, but you grew up in an Italian family, at least on your, on, on one side of the family, right? Yeah. On my grandmother's side. Is that the first place you learned to cook? It was with my grandmother and my aunts and uncles. That's my father's side of the family. And yes, that was the first, my mom, God bless her, was not a very good cook. So it was... Again, my grandmother's, my grandmother on my father's side and aunts and uncles was the first time that food really tasted good. <laughs> not, not that my mom's cooking didn't taste good, but this was different. This was delicious. How old were you like when you like actually remember that happening? I don't know, probably you know, maybe, maybe 10 or 12. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I think you have two kids, right? We do. Yeah. I have two kids, but they're much younger, three and five. And I'm always so curious. I, I get my son to like, he won't eat a lot, but I, I have him make pasta with me. And that's uh -huh. the only time he'll eat pasta. Now he actually eats pasta a bit more, but like, you know, he'll, when he rolls it out and like, you know, makes tagliatelle or something, then he wants to eat it because he wants to like play with it. Right. But I'm always like so curious, like, is any of this sticking with him? Is he actually going to enjoy cooking later or something? It will. And whether, because our, our daughters both, know how to cook. How old are they? 13 and 16. Oh, wow. So you're, you're almost done. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know. They'll have that skill forever, you know, whether it grows into a, a passion or not, but you know, the ability to cook and prepare food and prepare <laughs> what we hope as, as parents, right? Wholesome food. That's a skill they'll have forever and a skill that a lot of people don't have or have to develop later in life out of necessity. Yeah. It is interesting. I feel like people that aren't chefs, there's this sort of mystery about cooking that I feel like is wrong. I, you know, when people are like, ah, I don't know how to cook. I'm like, you probably do, you know, just taste it. And if you, yeah, if you're hungry enough, you're going to yeah. cook, you know, you're going to do your best to prepare something for yourself. But I agree. Cooking is not that difficult. It can be like anything, right? I mean, anything you Anything can be really challenging if you, if you dive deep enough into it. But yeah, look at what, you know, Jamie Oliver does in, I forget which show it is, but it's yeah. like, you know, three ingredients, less than 30 minutes or something like yeah. that. Like it's not, it, you're right. It's not that difficult to prepare simple food that tastes good, but you know, the, the trap for all of us is time, right? Yeah. And that's why convenience food is so easy because it's fast part of the skill i think it's difficult to cook food on time for a larger number of people consistently often but you know yeah. my, even if you're you know even if your number is four at home um that can be challenging because yeah. you know you, you don't just have to cook right you have to shop you have to know how much to cook and yeah you have to know how much to shop for how much to cook and yet, so, yes. And again, the challenge for all of us is time, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. If it's okay, I want to kind of fast forward a bit to, obviously you spent time in San Francisco, with Michael Mina, you were in Hawaii, um, on a cruise ship for a while. But maybe if, if it's okay, I want to fast forward a bit to Per Se, because with Per Se and then a number of places after that, you have a lot of pressure uh, with the roles that you take and the restaurants that you open. And I'm really curious like how you, how you handle pressure. Are there things that you do to deal with the pressure for yourself and maybe for your team? Well, I've learned the hard way uh, that you have to take care of yourself. How? What do, what do you do to take care of yourself? Well, on, on my best days, it's, it's exercise, it's getting enough rest, drinking enough water, like, sim- like simple things. You know, I have like a checklist of four or five things that I try to hold myself accountable to every day to try to, to do just that, to be able to keep up with, you know, a busy restaurant. Yeah. Do you try to instill that in your team as well? There's been some open kitchens you've worked at, things like that, like for the cooks as well, there's, there's pressure, you know? There is, there is a very, you know, there's a very high standard here. Uh, guest expectation is very high. And that, yeah, that translates to pressure on the team, both, you know, the, the women and men in the kitchen and the, you know, the dining room team as well. Yeah. I do remember, I think I ate at per se, like maybe not the month you started, but, but uh, I was working at Boulay and we like had the stove ripped out to get a new Multanian and we all had a week off uh-huh. and I came in for dinner. I remember it vividly. Uh, and then I, flew to San Francisco like the next day, like go eat at a bunch of spots there. It felt very like French laundry, but, but then it's own, you know, and, and I'm assuming that's, you know, that's, that's you. And, and that kind of goes back to this sort of question of pressure of like, you have pressure of, you know, at least in that regard, you had pressure of, you know, obviously critics, you had pressure of your team. I'm sure you had pressure from TK <laughs> to make sure that, it gets you know executed to his vision, but then also this sort of uniquely new New York thing. It's not a farmhouse. It's a you know it's in the Time Warner building, right? You know, do you feel like post the six years that you were there? What was your thoughts leaving there? Just generally speaking, I guess when I realized that I had goals outside of per se, I wanted to, you know, and I've said it before, like I wanted, I knew I knew needed to do something different. Like I wasn't going to go out and open this massive, you know, a, a fine dining, a, a French fine dining tasting menu restaurant. Uh, you know, I just didn't, I had just done that for almost eight years at per se in the French laundry. So the goal was to do something different. You know, this was 2008 ish, yep. you know, right in the bottom of that economic mm-hmm. collapse. <laughs> was not the time to to be trying to raise money to open a new restaurant especially someone that had never opened or like someone who had never run his own business right i you know i was a, a big part of per se but i had never done it quote on my own so the opportunity came up to do italian fine dining at lincoln you know that was with nick valenti and the patina group and it you know, it was the opportunity to do something, you know, I, it, I wasn't opening my own restaurant, but with Nick and the team at Patina at the time, I was a big part of that opening, both the work, the day-to-day work, but also the, I guess the conception of it, mm-hmm. like what, okay, it's going to be Italian fine dining, but what, what does that mean? And you know, we're right in the middle of Lincoln Center. So managing pre-theater and post-theater on top of, you know, a busy, a busy restaurant. Like it was, that was new to me at Lincoln. Yeah. Is that, is that the, the pre-theater and the post-theater? We would be, the dining, the dining room would be full some days at, you know, 5, 5.15. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, in hindsight, most people would kill for that. You know, to get that or, yo, oh, you get a five o'clock seating. Well, that makes all the difference in the world, right? Especially if you know that you're going to turn those tables over by seven, seven thirty yeah. for the, the seven thirty in the eight o'clocks, which are often 
the most sought after. So that was a unique restaurant and location for a restaurant. I was there for six years, really proud of what, you know, what we did there it was a very, very busy restaurant, a lot going on there and, you know, got to work with a really talented group of people there. Yeah. Do you know John Adler? Yeah. Do you know John well? He was adamant about asking me a couple questions. Okay. Asking you a couple questions. So the first one was about the tripe oreganata and per se. He felt it was kind of like, was it, was it like a coup or something? But I guess, generally speaking, was that like a difficult dish internally to get on the menu? It wasn't at all. No. You know, I think Chef Keller, like, I think like most chefs, uh, loves tripe. So it wasn't, is it the Italian nature of it? I that think was, they, I think that was, yeah. Yeah, I know. But per se, in the, you know, the philosophy of the French laundry too, of course, you know, rooted in French cuisine, but ingredients and techniques from all over the world. And, you know, the annulotti pasta and the tagliatelle, like there's some pretty classic, you know, French laundry dishes yeah. that, that go right to Italy. So, you know, I think the philosophy at, French Laundry in per se, I haven't worked there for a long time, but I'm confident it's the same, is, or has always been like, what's the best, what's the best that we can prepare? Like, what's the best version of this that we can prepare? And, you know, that could be fish from Hawaii with edamame and soy sauce. And it doesn't sound like a 100% French dish, but again, the best ingredients, the best technique, bold flavors. The other one that you did mention was the lobster crepe with peas and carrots, which I remember. And it was a pretty hit of a dish. And then you took it off the menu, you retired it. That dish has a, has a long history. So when I worked at the French Laundry 30 years ago, I was, I started as a comi and then I, I was, then I was the fish cook and that was, there was a renovation that happened and the, the the original kitchen, which was the Sally Schmidt's kitchen, there was a new kitchen built. Anyway, the, the restaurant closed. And then when we came back, the tasting menu started and then lobster started. And then we just served the tail, right? So there was all this lobster claw and knuckle meat that there, there wasn't a use for. So Wait, what did they do with it before this dish happened? <laughs> I think that was the challenge is yeah. we're starting with, we're starting this tasting menu. Okay. Now we have all this. What do we do with all this lobster meat? Yeah. That's where that dish came from uh -huh. with the pea, pea shoots and carrot reduction. Um, it was really a, a dish that was created to use a byproduct, but still be unique and delicious. And you know, that, that dish was on the lunch menu forever. I think we ultimately moved away from it just to the goal was to just serve a tail. Yeah. And then there were other like other outlets for the the claw and the knuckle meat. Like I think we sold it in the PDR for large parties. Anyway. Yeah. Not to go off on a no, no, tangent. You know, well, part of what, you know, I'm curious about is like you've you definitely gravitated towards I was the upper echelon of fine dining, how you know, type of cuisine. But there's like this very clear Italian root to what you do. And there, there is sort of this, I, I think it's actually a, a misconception that Italian food has a lot less finesse, a lot less precision. It's a lot more like, you know, feel. And there is a lot of soul to it. But there also can be a lot of precision to it, right? Like perfectly sauced piece of pasta and, you know, and any of these things. Is there a point in your life where you feel like you would, want to just go all in super casual might be the wrong word but casual type of Italian maybe less refined and just sort of yeah that would be amazing but you know I would have to have to make that happen right have to get that have to get that open what do you think is the like the the biggest challenge to that versus opening a fine dining restaurant where where would that restaurant be would that restaurant be in Westchester would that restaurant be in Manhattan Hope yeah, the, the notion of casual Italian is incredibly exciting. We eat that way at home often. And, you know, I just started, I just started here. Like I, I just hit a year wow. here. You know, we, the restaurant hasn't even been opened a year yet. Yeah. So I want to. So what is, what do you think that means? Casual Italian? Cause you're cooking 
I mean, even some of the dishes here, you know, there's there's obviously, you know, pastas and things like that. You've obviously cooked a lot of Italian food in the past. You know, when is finesse actually detract from and make it less Italian? And when is it actually just way better to, you know, to apply that finesse and that precision? I, I mean, I think you, you said it, there is a lot of, there's a lot of finesse in Italian cuisine. I mean, the, the craft of making pasta, the craft of making salumi, you know, not everything has to be, you know, cut into a, <laughs> a micro brunoise and put on a plate with tweezers, you know, that's, that's haute cuisine, right? But also, you know, being able to toss a, a perfect bowl of pasta in a pan, get it out to the guest hot. You know, there's there's a lot of skill yeah. that goes into that as well. Yeah, I mean, look, yeah, glazing something perfectly, uh, glazing a pasta perfectly on the plate is really difficult or can be. Do you think it would be challenging to not to see the diced mirepoix that's going to go into something and and see that it's not perfectly diced? And be able to let it. Yeah, it depends on the. It depends on the restaurant, right? It depends on the philosophy of the restaurant. You know, in a more in a more casual setting, the sofrito, the vegetable, kind of gets melted into the, yeah. the sauce. You know, in a, in a fine dining restaurant, yeah, <laughs> you got to see all that little dice. Yeah, I mean, you know, something I I, I don't know you that well actually we haven't interacted and we and we also haven't even worked in very different restaurant trajectories but from what i gather you're a very disciplined person john had mentioned that one of your cooks or, or someone that you work with tom sellers had mentioned that you are the most disciplined human that he's ever met one i would love to get your take on that but but also you know part of running the kitchens that you run isn't just the, the precision of perfectly dicing a, you know uh, a vegetable but the culture that is created around that of the right angles and a perfectly clean station and clean towels and making sure your aprons, all those, all those things, right? Do you feel like you can still sort of do sort of a casual restaurant and a casual Italian restaurant if those things are absent or those things have to be part of that and then figure out a way to loosen the food, you know? I know that you can have both. You can have a more more casual style restaurant that, you know, is run with precision. And it really, it, it really has to be today, you know, because the, the business of running a restaurant is so challenging today. You know, the margins are leaner than ever. You know, food is expensive. Labor is expensive. It's challenging. You know, look at, look at where we're, you know, look at where we're sitting. You know, the, the New York City market is incredibly difficult. Yeah, that's a great point. Like having that sort of that culture also can be a huge help to uh, to the margins. I remember working at Cafe Gray. We did, I think, we might have done twelve million our first year. Still losing money. All that precision and still, not, yeah. You know, it, it's it's a it's a really really difficult business. You know, I've worked in New York for so long. It's it's difficult everywhere. I don't I don't know the market and. Los Angeles or Chicago well. I know the restaurants. Um, I don't know what it's like to do business there. I do know what it's like to do business in New York and it's really tough. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, and it's, it's definitely changed a lot. My first job was right around the corner about 25 years ago, almost at the old Oceana. Uh -huh. And I walked past it today and um, it just reminded me of just how different it is at restaurants today in New York, not just the margins and the rent, which is everything, availability to cooks. And it's pretty incredible. How's it going here? It's going well. You know, we just got through August is always, August is always challenging in New York. Uh, speaking of <laughs> uh, operating here, you know, right after Labor Day, when the kids go back to school, it usually marks a time when people kind of settle in for the, for Q4 and doing business in Q4. You know, a lot of offices are mandating a return to work, which yes. selfishly, in my opinion, is a good thing because it gets more people into the city. People are dining out. People are going to lunch. People are doing business in restaurants, going out for drinks, having private events. Those are all of the things that, you know, you need all of those things to 
to run a successful business here. And this restaurant, 425 Park, you know, has a large bar. So is, is this an office building or a hotel? Or is it? Office building. Don't you? Is it fully occupied? I believe it's 90, 95% yeah. occupied. You said you do get pre theater here too? We will see that 5, 5.30 seating. And I don't know if that's, you know, yes, that's the pre theater time slot. I don't know how many of those guests are going off to a show. Yeah. I think it's a lot of people who are getting out of an office or maybe doing business, you know, still doing business that have to get home somewhere. You know, they want to have their dinner, whether it's a, a social dinner or, or business dinner. And then they either, you know, they want to get home and jump on a train, go to Westchester or Connecticut or New Jersey. So we'll start to see that, that early seating as we get further into the season. Yeah. How's the team, how's, how's team, how's service going? The team is fantastic. We are, you know, like everybody, we're always hiring, just always looking for staff. It's that, you know, yeah. three steps forward, two steps back. You know, we hire, hire two good line cooks and then a line cook leaves. Is that happening a lot more now than, than it did, you know, a decade ago or so? I think staffing has always been challenging. More challenging to run a business today, for sure, because again, the margins are so tight. And how much did, you know, what was your schedule when you worked at Oceana? Uh, six days with the double on Sunday. <laughs> and, right. Uh, shift pay. <laughs> yeah. And you, got, and you got overtime, right? No, no disrespect to Oceana because everybody operated that yeah, way. Yeah. Um, but you can't operate that way any longer. Yeah, really there are things, there's, there's, you know, these labor laws yeah. that get in the way. Uh, that was the standard, I think, six days of the double shift pay for yeah. quite a while. And boy, that was what a, what a grueling yeah. schedule. I also never thought of it as that. That was the job. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like you were going to go across the street and work, you know, eight hours a day with a 30 minute meal break, which yeah. is, you know, that's the schedule today. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's shifted now where you, as you know, you have to have, you know, you have a large prep team in the morning. And they do the bulk of the, the work. Here we have a lunch team and a dinner team. The lunch team, you know, they they have a lot more time in the morning. So together with the prep team, they're really doing the production for the yep. day. I mean, the dinner cooks come in at three, and they have to have a meal break. So it's really just That's getting nice. putting mise en place together. It's challenging here too because you know our prep kitchen is in the basement. And the the main dining room is on two. Yeah, it's an ele it's a service elevator. Yeah, just all day long, right? Yeah, so great. there's time lost in. Yeah, are they coming in early in transportation? Three? Some do. Some will yeah. come in a little bit early to get you know a jump start on the day. Check in with their partner. They're not supposed to. Yeah, I, I remember. Like I vividly remember the shift when shift pay became the you know hey you shouldn't do that anymore. This was like you know early two thousands, and so you would have a schedule but you just never follow the schedule. <laughs> you know, you're, yeah. you're scheduled three, but everybody came in at 11. Yeah, I remember. I remember that well. <laughs> what are you most excited about? Both here, but then just generally speaking, I imagine you probably don't have a lot of time to eat out, but just generally speaking, like, what are you excited about? It's New York, right? And I, I don't know if it was Eater or the New York Times that came out with their fall preview. You know, there's 30 big restaurants on the horizon this fall. You know, and probably many, many more that aren't getting, you know, the, the big, the big press. So it's an exciting time for New York. People are, you know, the city's getting busier, uh, after, after August falls a great season for, for cooking. And this will be the first because we opened in December of last year. So we didn't have a fall season. We've been through winter, spring, and summer, mm -hmm. but this will be the first fall at the restaurant. So we're working on, you know, working a lot on a lot of new dishes, uh, and it'll be a very busy season for private events for us. Yeah. We haven't seen that yet either. So lots of, uh, anything in particular you're excited about cooking right now? It seems like I'm always excited about seafood and pasta. We have a lot of really nice kind of, I guess what I would call crudo or raw fish dishes on the menu. Uh, we're limited as to what we can do with pasta here on the line. 
So we currently run three and could probably get to four pastas on the menu. And that, that would, that would be our limit because we don't have a, we don't have a pasta cooker on the line, not to get too far. Yeah. We're a little bit limited for space up there, but you know, three to four pastas. Great. Yeah. How deep are you getting into like making fresh pasta right now? I mean, we have three on the menu. We make two and then we use one, dry, we use one dried. Yeah. What's on the menu that's fresh right now? Uh, we make a spaghetti alla chitarra and an annulotti. Oh, nice. I mean, that's always a tough thing, you know, once you know, you're running a kitchen and your cooks are making all this because making pasta is pretty fun, you know. I mean, at scale, it can be a pain in the ass, but um, you probably don't get to make it as much. Uh, no, I, I don't. And I, I guarantee the team makes it, makes it better than I do. Um, but that's going back to managing a busy restaurant and staying sane. You know, for me, that means not just working in the restaurant, but working in the kitchen Yeah, and picking up jobs, touching food, cutting fish, making family meal periodically, just something to, to have a presence in the kitchen outside of service, Yeah, you know, to have a presence during the production. I mean, that's where the, that's where the passion and the joy is, right? There it's, it's in the, the preparation of the food and then it's in obviously serving guests, but that's twofold as you know right there's the there's the prep that happens during the day and then there's the you know yeah. there's the fast paced service at night and the prep during the day is maybe a little bit more like cooking at home it's just yeah. like a, take one more breath service you know service is service yeah they they are such they're two very different things i love prep way more than service cuz you know but they are very different i'm curious like you've run so many restaurants now you know, rewind a decade or so ago, maybe more than a decade ago, like how have you changed as a chef and, and as a leader? You know, obviously you're not, yeah, you, know, you can be on the line sometimes, you're sort of going back and forth and doing different things, but like, how are you different today than you were 10, 15 years ago? And like, are there things that you would, are there things that you would tell yourself back then that you wish you knew? Well, I would have told myself to, you know, take a breath and, and take better care of myself. You know, I think, What's different is it's often said, you know, lead by example. That's a, it's a popular, popular phrase, right? But for me, that means, you know, there's no, treat people how you want to be treated, right? I think that's the difference is there's no room in our, there's no room in our world anymore for the vision of the, you know, tyrannical chef. Yeah. Like that, I <laughs> <laughs> I wish that person good luck, but that just doesn't, it doesn't exist. I, I, I'm sure it exists. There's no place for it in our industry yeah. any longer. And again, I'll speak in the first person. That's not how I behave. Did you I, ever behave that way? I did a little bit. Yes. I let the, the pressure get the best of me a um, mm -hmm. couple of times. I bet the open kitchen helped change that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I there were a lot of, there were several emails and several conversations about keeping, you know, keeping the volume down mm -hmm. at, at Lincoln because, and here, you know, here as well, because at 425, it's an open kitchen yeah. and a much smaller restaurant. I mean, Lincoln was massive yeah. and st still, you know, the volume in the kitchen uh, would get away from us. And here, here we have to be careful about just the, and it, it's not profanity but it's it's you know communicating clearly with the cooks and still keeping the, yeah it's not yelling and screaming that's the issue here um it's just volume control especially when yes you know the first yeah. seating when the dining room's not that busy don't don't belt out that <laughs> don't belt out that first order this show is brought to you by you guessed it Mies. Mies helps thousands of restaurants and food service businesses all over the world build profitable menus and scale their business successfully if you're looking to organize your recipe IP and train your team to put out a consistent product every day in less time than ever before, then Mies is just for you. And you can transform all those old Google Docs and Word Docs and PDFs and spreadsheets and Google Sheets into dynamic, actionable recipes in Mies in lightning speed. Plus, stop all that manual work of processing invoices because Mies will digitize all your purchases automatically. And there's a built-in database of ingredient yields, prep yields, and unit-to-measure conversions for every ingredient. 
which means you're going to get laser accurate food costs in a fraction of the time. Visit www.getmees.com. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z.com to learn more. And check out the show notes moving forward because we're going to be adding promotions and discount codes so that all of you lovely and brilliant Mies podcast listeners get a sweet deal on Mies. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I don't think that any of us were ever trained about how to, how to manage. And if we were yelled at, <laughs> then you just see that's the way that, you know, that it is. It's, it's a big, it takes the entire industry to sort of break that habit, unless you're Eric Repair and you can quietly tell somebody that their chives are wrong in, in their ear and them. <laughs> yeah. And, so, that, and that's, I think, you know, with power comes responsibility, right? And, you know, you don't have to scream as, you don't have to scream at someone to solve a problem you know you can you can get your point across mm. um especially you know at the level of someone like chef repair without raising your voice above a conversation level yeah maybe we should all just be more buddhist <laughs> i mean how else have you evolved i mean obviously some of this just sort of has to happen right as we you know of the less screaming and things like that but how how else are you different today you know cooking from, you know, decade or so ago. Cooking and leading. Cooking and leading the style of cuisine here at 425 Park. I mean, this is a this is a Jean Georges restaurant. You know, it's a it's a collaboration between myself and the chef and the team, you know, the Jean Georges management team that drives, you know, that drives the restaurants. So, you know, I'm learning his perspective and together, you know, together we, you know, we create the, the menu menus at, at 425, the chef, the company are incredibly committed to the green market. You know, they don't just say it, they really, they do it. You know, he's there, he's there often. So we have, you know, access to incredible product and the support to buy incredible product as well as, you know, a beautiful kitchen and an environment, you know, to prepare it in. Yeah. Do you think you are more restrained as a, as a cook now or more adventurous? I mean, obviously I think you spent time also like in, in Japan. And so you have a lot of other influences and obviously Sean George has a lot of the, you know, Asian Southeast Asian influence as well, but is your style of food significantly different than it was, you know, a decade or so ago? A hundred percent. You know, I'm older. I'd like to believe more mature. <laughs> um, certainly have learned a great deal, kept an open mind, got to travel, got to work in great restaurants, continue to work with great people. And, you know, we're lucky to live and work in New York. You know, have access to almost every style of cuisine here, ingredients. It's an amazing, it's an amazing place to work. What is influencing you today mostly? Are there things that come to mind that uh, that are driving the most of your sort of creativity or just how you think about cooking your food? We're focused right now on fall and fall menu. And it's always exciting, you know, it's exciting to see new dishes. Obviously, not just, not just I get excited about new dish dishes, but it's the team, you know, you you remember the, you know, being on a station for a while and that, that black bass dish, boy, I wish that, you know, I would really love to see something different. I feel like I've cooked a million of them. Well, you probably have cooked a million of them. Um, and yes, it's time for that black bass dish to change. So, but the dish, you know, the dish needs to get, goes through a, a tasting. Obviously we need to get it costed. We need to introduce it to the team and we probably have, I don't know, we probably have 25 dishes on our menu, uh, plus the dessert menu. You're right. When you think about changing dishes, it really, it's a, can be a big lift, especially, a, you know, a seasonal change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, could, I mean, the menu here, there's, there's I mean, influence from all over, you know, there's not one, I mean, I, think I see Japanese things, I see yuzu koshu with, with, I think, veal, there's like, you know, Italian, there's, is it sort of, the world's your oyster do, do you know kind of what's the directive you know yeah i think the directive we spoke about it earlier is the same it's it's what's the best thing that we can put on the plate you know from 
what are the best ingredients that we can buy? And the philosophy is bold flavors. And how do we, you know, how do we coax that out of, you know, the ingredients that, that we're using? Yeah. So we were talking about your, your cooks earlier and you've been cooking for several decades now. I'm curious, like when it has changed. And so let's just, let's also remove from this question, short staffing, talking to like new cooks today. And sous chefs, like when is it? When do you think a cook is ready to go become a sous chef, and and a sous chef ready to become an executive chef? That happens a lot faster today than it did ten, twenty, thirty years ago. I think that's up to the individual. You know, like when do when do you think you're ready? You know, if 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 I can look back and say, you know, I'm glad the way my career went, the people that I got to work with. The decisions that I made, you know, I took my time and made sure I had a foundation before, you know, I took that. I guess my first real sous chef job was when we opened Craft with with Marco and Tom. I was in my mid twenties at that time. You know, had worked at some great restaurants with you know really great people, and one thing that. Hindsight's twenty twenty, but I feel like I missed the business. If I had to do it over again, I think I would have tried to have done the CIA and then going on to get a bachelor's in accounting, ideally like restaurant accounting or hospitality management. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I know I keep saying it, but it's you know if you can't manage, if you can't manage a business, if you can't pay your bills on time, I don't care how talented you are. You know, you really, you have to have both. And I yeah. think, again, I've been lucky. I've worked for, you know, great chefs, but I've also worked for great companies that were transparent about the P&L and shared that with the kitchen managers and the people that impact it. Going back to, well, craft, and then, you know, the Thomas Keller restaurant group, certainly Patina. You know, there was, there was a lot of effort and resources devoted to those P&L meetings and not just reviewing the numbers, but teaching, you know, great CFOs, great, you know, presidents of the company like Nick Valenti would break down the P&L and really mm-hmm. take the time to explain. My mindset was always, okay, there's the craft of cooking and spend the most time doing that before considering any sort of like management, like a, like a sous chef role. And it's funny, I actually, in hindsight, think I'm not sure there's a beauty to that of like the, okay, you know, cook this thing a million times, millions of times, you know, so that you have, the, you know, like it's rote, the ability to air as a piece of fish or that, the, you know, the temp of this thing or that, you know, how to, you know, cut these things without thinking. But to your point, you know, the restaurant is so much more than, than that. And it's just like, how do you balance starting to learn all those things? You only have so much of a life. There's a half-life of, <laughs> you know, of learning and then running a business and running a restaurant. And like, I really do think about cooks today. You know, we talked to, you know, these cooks coming out of like culinary schools and we see a lot of them. And I get asked, like, hey, should I go, you know, to college? Should I, should I try to get a management job? And I don't actually know. I, my first response is always, you know, just, keep your head down and just keep learning how to cook and just do that for as long as you can. But I wonder, I wonder if not learning those management skills early enough can stunt the ability to, you know, have the, the future thing that you're looking for when you want it. Again, hindsight for, for me, I think the CIA followed by, you know, a bachelor's degree in hospitality management. There's certainly way more options to do that now than there was when I was at the CIA, but there were still possibilities because you can, you know, you can work at the same time. I had a part-time job working in a restaurant when I was at the CIA. I didn't go on to college, but could have done the same thing, could have, you know, continued learning, you know, practicing cooking while going to school. Anyway, that's... You went to Greenbrier too, right? 
I did. I, I did my uh, externship from the Culinary Institute at the Greenbrier. That was sort of the prime of Greenbrier. That was, would. I mean, that, that, I don't know what it's like today. I haven't been back I, there. I, I don't mean to say the Greenbrier is. It's still a there, grand but. hotel. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a long time ago. And that was a, an amazing place with all the different things that were going on, all the different things that were going on within food and beverage there. Yeah. I mean, is there other advice that you'd give to cooks starting today? You know, find a place to work where people are going to teach you. And that's, that's becoming more difficult today because managing labor is so challenging. You know, you also want to find an environment that feels good. Like we talked a lot about discipline and uh, standards, but it has to be, there has to, there's a human side too, right? Like it's not all pain and suffering in our kitchen. Like there, there has to be, you know, there has to be a sense of humor. It is stressful. The days can be long. It's a weird schedule, right? You work at night, you work on the holidays, your friends typically become, you know, people that work in the industry because you share, you know, you share the same schedule, making time for family and friends outside of the quote normal, you know, nine to five Saturday, Sunday off lifestyle. You know, you really have to make an effort. It's still a very can be a very challenging business to work in. Still very gratifying. You know, New York is still an incredible place to experience food and culture, the culture of food, and start, you know, start and grow your career. Like there's still so many great restaurants here and diversity. Yeah. You think your daughters might want to get into the industry? I don't know. They like, as you know, you want... You want your kids to be happy, right? And if that means working in restaurants, all right, I get it. We'll see. Let's just pretend one of them was 18 today, decided not to go to college, and they wanted to go work at a restaurant, and it couldn't be your restaurant. Where would you send them? I am biased because I worked at Gramercy Tavern, but Gramercy Tavern was a great school for me. I was there for, I think, two and a half years, maybe a little bit longer. I think it's still a great school for, for cooks today. Yeah. 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 And Michael's a credible chef. Yeah. Michael's, Michael's amazing. The team that they have there is amazing. Um, you know, the green market's right there. You, you said you sort of jump on the station sometimes. You obviously you're working service. You're maybe going to the, to the dining room. Are you still making family meal every once in <laughs> I made family meal the other day. We'll see today. We're short we're short staff today. I might have to today as well. I don't make it every day, nor, nor I don't, I've n- I never made it every day, but it's important. And I certainly, you know, that's definitely the most like cooking at home, right? Is just yeah. taking literally what's in the fridge and making, so- trying to make something delicious out of it and fa- like fast, right? Cause you don't have, yeah, you don't have enough time to get the work done. Oh, I got to make family meal too. Well. Yeah. I feel like that is a, another part of the culture of great kitchens that doesn't get talked about it enough the importance of making a good family meal and the skill and sometimes pressure. I remember when I was at my, my, I remember my first job and I had to make family meal and I was 19. I was a job in a kitchen. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I had to make family meal for the entire restaurant. It was terrifying. You know, do you have any sort of guidelines or culture or precedent you set for your team about staff meal? Well, I eat it. So, <laughs> you know, it better be good. <laughs> But do you, is, is there like leeway? Do they get to experiment sometimes or? There's just. Not enough time now? There's just not, there's not enough time to do, you know, I'm not going to say family meal is always wholesome. Some, honestly, some days it's better than others, but for most of our team, it's maybe the only real meal they're going to get. Yeah. You, know, you get up, you have a cup of, grab a cup of coffee, grab a bagel on, on the train get to work, work a shift, maybe working a double, you know, we have a small break room here where, where the staff can sit and take their meal break. We do two meals a day, seven days a week. Wow. So it's a lot. I mean, we typically feed, I don't know, 50, 35, 50 to 75 yeah. staff a day. You know, it could be 30, maybe 25 to 30 for the AM family meal and a little bit more for the yeah. PM family meal. But that's a, I mean, that's a, 
it's a lot of food yeah and it's a lot of work to get you know even simple mm -hmm. chicken rice and beans well somebody still has to prepare it you still have to make it taste good you still have to get it out hot at 3 p.m because yeah people are starting their shift and they want to know where family meal is yeah i wonder if that is maybe one of the things one of the downsides of and, and look i think it totally makes sense to have your know, schedule is set and you come in at this time and but the ability to come in a few hours early because you're excited to make mole or something for a family meal you know was fun and you're learning you could experiment you could try things and learn from it learn from the other cooks i don't know if that still can exist if there's if there's uh but it's it's challenging right because you know if i come in if i'm at work off the clock and i cut and i yeah. hurt myself well now the restaurant's liable. Yeah. And as a manager, as the chef, like why, why is Josh here two hours early yeah. to make family meal? Well, because Josh is excited about making family meal, but he can't be here. Like yeah. he's a liability. Yeah. You know? And, you know, sorry, we'll pick on Josh again for a second. Disgruntled Josh <laughs> can come back at us and say, well, you know, yeah, I worked there. I worked there off the clock. Yeah. It's tough and it's a, it's a different world now. What makes you really angry, like blood boiling angry? I think la lack of respect, you know, lack of respect for the team, lack of respect for the, you know, the kitchen, slamming the pots and pans, you know, burning something in a pan and lack of respect for the food, right? Like, you know, what it took to get those green beans from the green market in this restaurant was not easy and we paid a you know we paid a premium so to to overcook them or you know cut them incorrectly and throw them away like just a waste yeah and it's disrespectful how do you communicate that to your team just that way you have to be firm not abusive i'm not screaming but you have to let the person know why that's wrong yeah and that doesn't does it doesn't have to be demeaning it's not demeaning. It's just like, listen, there's nothing more important than the food that we serve to our guests. There's nothing more important than those ingredients and treating them with respect. Yeah. I think that's also one of the beautiful things about being in a great kitchen that translates to life is you start to, you have to have this respect for the product and the people and the equipment can't have good food without that. How you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, like when you hire new cooks, are they, are they getting that message right away about respect? And Yes. And is that a conversation? Not, not always, but you know, this is a, this is a beautiful environment. We have, you know, beautiful kitchen to work in, uh, beautiful ingredients. And what we do now, the interview process, usually we'll get a candidate in, interview them. And then, as you know, we have to onboard people now for a kitchen trail. Mm -hmm. So once we get that person through the onboarding, usually have them come in and work half a day with us. And they get a real, we get a sense of yep. the individual. The candidate also knows like what they're getting themselves into. Like, mm -hmm. okay, this is, this place is serious. This place has recipes mm -hmm. that are in grams yep. with in, like instructions and the, the sous chefs are tasting things. It's clean, relatively well organized, uh, depending on the day. So yes, I think the message that this is a serious yep. place. And I hope that this is the message that this is a place where you can learn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like coming full circle. I think a lot about culture and you were talking about in the beginning of this conversation about, we were talking about precision and how that relates to, you know, Italian food. I remember that Fred and I had two seasons of this podcast and I was asking a lot of people in the first season about how they like, create culture and Matteo from Jasper Hill farm, incredible culture, by the way, that, that farm, I don't know if you ever had, the, you probably had Jasper Hill cheap. I have, cheese. yeah. Uh, and I asked him like, how do you like get everybody involved to uh, buy into this sort of culture you have like are there messages or boy he's like he's just like we just do it every day and that's how we create it and i think that's the same in the kitchen to your point and why those commitments to excellence and to cleanliness and organization are so important because it isn't just 
because those are important, but that sends the message. And it's such a stronger message than, hey, you should respect the food. You know, when you see the chef walk in and, you know, means their station and everything is sort of tight, that, that sends a much bigger message than <laughs> make sure you respect this food. I imagine that must be, you know, the biggest training that someone sees when they come to your kitchen. It's just the way that it actually operates. Yeah, people, people see, again, people see that this is a, this is a professional environment. And I think for, is this environment for everyone? No, um, in this environment, I'm not going to say it's better or worse. You know, it's a restaurant that's run at a very high level. And you have to buy into that if you're going to be, if you're going to be successful here. Yeah. I know you got to get to service soon. So just wrapping up, like, what are you excited about for the future of the next year, two years, five years? Do you think about that? I do. Certainly growing the, the business here at 425 Park, hopefully seeing New York continue to, to build momentum. I mean, we need, sorry, we need guests, right? We need guests in our restaurants. We need people in our restaurants supporting our restaurants, spending money. And that comes from, you know, that comes from a, a robust city, a robust economy. You know, a lot of things, a lot of things need to happen if, if we're going to be successful. Yeah. So one day, I know this is not today or a year from now, but uh, I'm just speaking selfishly because I also live in Westchester. Is there going to be a, is there going to be a dining restaurant in Westchester we can go to? I don't know if that's the if that's the dream or the nightmare. It's I think it's even more challenging and huge amount of respect for people that make restaurants work up there. You know, this is New York, right? The city that never sleeps. I don't know about your town, but my town's pretty sleepy. Oh, there's, um, there's it's a desert. <laughs> it's a, it's and, a desert. you know, how do you get you know, how do you and most people you have to drive, right? Yeah. So, you know, you're okay, that's it. Two glasses of wine, I'm I'm done. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's, that is a good point. And you're going to go out with friends on a Tuesday night for dinner. What? <laughs> we do that sometimes, not often, but you know, New York, New York is just a different New York city. It's just a different, yeah, a different beast. Yeah. And it's still really tough yeah. to make a, to make a business work here. Yeah. I almost feel like in Westchester, it needs to be like a market in a restaurant or something so that there's something else yeah that they can, ca you know catering you know you just need so much more or it's it's just different different business model in the suburbs than it is yeah here in new york city yeah. and it's only i mean hastings is 20 miles from here like it's, it's not really not that it's far, crazy how different but it's it totally yeah. it's just a different westchester itself is different yeah it's the suburbs yeah. yeah people people behave differently when they're at home yeah have you been to Senadu, by the way? I have not. It's good. It's little, I mean, everything is 25 minutes in Westchester. Right. Like, but it's, uh, I mean, there's like nothing by us. Like literally nothing. There's like a Georgian spot and then there's Senadu and then we have to drive to Terrytown if right. we want, you know, anything else. But I would check it out. It's really good. Uh, Ex-Danielle guy. Anyways, this was great. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, making this work. I know we tried a couple times and uh, we finally made it happen. So great. You have to get back to work now. I'm so I do. All right. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z dot -E com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little bit better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.